Hey, I want you to take your Bible this morning, turn back to the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22. And we're going to be looking at a passage there that, uh, that we should be uh, giving certain thoughts to, especially in these days in which we live. Now remember, just to give you a little uh, promo again, on Wednesday night as we've been talking about the uh, scientific creation to scientific cataclysm being the flood, um, uh, Noah is building the ark, uh, the animals are getting ready to go in, and the rain's getting ready to fall, all right? Just to bring you up to date, we're going to pick it up right there on Wednesday night and uh, begin to see what took place that was well more than just rain falling and becoming like a, a type of flash flood. A lot of things were taking place. So come and join us in here as we look at those particular things on uh, Wednesday night. Well, if you're turned there to the book of the Revelation, chapter 22, there's a, uh, we're going to start in verse number 6, and we're going to read throughout uh, the remainder of that chapter there. So if you will stand, we'll honor God's Word at this time. And I want you to notice the words that uh, the Lord Jesus is speaking and to and through um, uh, the Apostle John as he is writing these words. A prophecy for us for today. But I want you to notice the, how the words are put together. Notice what he is actually saying, and then we'll begin to get into that. And so, as he is writing this, this the last chapter of this last book of the Bible, he picks up there as what we know to be verse number 6. Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true. The Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. And then he said to me, See, that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and your, and, your, and your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, you're to worship God. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. And he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. And, I, and behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are the dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Jesus, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I'm the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who is thirst, come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book that if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in the book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things that are written in this book. He who testifies these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. And the word for today is that, Lord, you are coming.
and you've promised that you're going to come back and you're going to receive us and we know that that is definitely a day that's on your calendar though we have no idea of when it's going to be lord i pray that today our hearts will be ready for that which is taking place in this world that which you have said is going to take place and how those two will undoubtedly mesh together lord you told us that jesus was going to come that he was going to be born in bethlehem he told so many things about him and surely it came to pass right in the current events of that day the same will be with your coming so lord this day our prayer is that our hearts will be ready that our souls will be in a position that we know Christ as Savior, that we'll be working for you so there's not to be embarrassed when we stand before the judgment seat. So, Father, speak to every heart in this place today. And, Lord, I thank you for what you're going to do in and through your message. Hide the messenger today. May you be uplifted, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we began to think about the day of our Lord's coming. We know this, as the title says today, He is coming quickly. You can't read that passage of Scripture without seeing the wording that is used over and over again. I am coming quickly. Behold, I am coming quickly. Three times in verses 7, 12, and 20, he uses that terminology. If you have a red-letter edition of the Scripture, you'll find that it is Jesus who is speaking those words each and every time. He is the one who is saying that. There is no doubt about the fact of what Jesus is saying here. And because we have not seen him and your first thought would be as the scoffing world would be today that well they've been saying that for 2,000 years and he still has not come quickly and what we have to understand is is not so much that Jesus uh, may be and we're thinking about this in his imminent soon return as in that day that it was going to be soon but what he's really saying is in that day for our day today is that it's going to be sudden that's the quickly that he is using here Christ coming will be sudden and there'll be nothing else that a person can do at that particular point if they have not trusted Christ when we began to think about his coming certain individuals that we certainly look up to across uh, history today of those who have lived are living and uh, and have not gone into heaven as of yet some have uh, Henry Blackaby says, how are your bank accounts? They won't matter when he comes back. What is your long-range plans? They won't matter when he comes back. The Lord's return is so near, long-range plans are foolish when there's so little time left. John Hagee says, one day in the not-too-distant future, a king will come, the promised Messiah, and then Jew and Gentile alike will see him and walk upon the streets of Jerusalem. Together we will shout for joy as we look upon the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And then Billy Graham said this, the signs of insecurity and shouts of revelation heard around the world are perhaps the death rattle of an end to an era in civilization. The scriptures promise that he, God, will act dramatically, that he will send his son back to earth. Charles Chuck Swindoll, as we know him, says the Lord is going to return. We need to get ready. And then finally, David Jeremiah says the hour is the hour hand on God's time clock is wound up and spinning. It's not if he's coming, it's when he's coming. But when he comes, it will be quickly, it will be suddenly, and it will take place. The thing that throws many people off, quite honestly, about his coming is, well, I know what Scripture says, and a day is as a thousand years before the Lord, a thousand years as a day, and why hasn't he come? We don't know. We may have 6,000 more years before his coming. That wasn't the thought of what God was really trying to impress upon us in trying to push it out there. Again, the fact that he's coming soon coming quickly because jesus said that when you began to see the tree blossom and things began to come forth when the signs of the times are being fulfilled matthew 24 is filled with those times he said you can know that these are the precursors the end is not yet but his coming is there and so people get the the prophecies a little bit messed up there are two comings that we have to talk about First of all, is the coming of Christ for his saints. And the second coming is the coming of Christ with his saints. 
The first coming of Christ for his saints would be the rapture, the rapture of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not any particular church. That's not just Southern Baptist Church. That is any church, um, that person who is a part of the church, those who have been saved, redeemed by the blood of Christ from every tribe and tongue and nation and various churches who preach a true salvation only found in Christ, we will be caught up one day together in the rapture of the church to meet the Lord in the air that is going to take place the problem comes in is that some people say well this prophecy has not taken place yet this prophecy has not taken place yet remember that it was Jesus who said talking not about the time of the rapture when Jesus will take us who are true believers out of here but he's talking about after the seven year period of the great tribulation that we've been rescued from he's talking about coming back that as we'll be with him with his saints this time to end the great tribulation to put his foot down on the Mount of Olives which will cleave in the midst of it and there he will begin to set up his thousand year reign upon this earth as it will be a, a brand new era in everything that we would know there are two different comings that we have to talk about so many times people say well you know one of the prophecies is that the gospel has to be preached to the ends of the earth then the end will come that's exactly right that's talking about the second coming of Christ when he comes with his church nothing about his first coming has yet to be fulfilled everything that we see about Christ first coming there's no major prophecy that any of the great evangelical leaders would say today that needs still to be done before Jesus could come at any moment at any second of this day tomorrow this week whenever it may happen to be that ought to cause us to be looking on every side it ought to cause us to be uh, thinking about the things that we're doing and not doing it ought to be think causing us to think about getting things prepared if Jesus is first coming for his true church children of God we ought to be ready and so first of all if you're thinking today am I really ready do I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I have repented of my sins I have trusted what Christ did on the cross was for me and if I have not why not and listen if you haven't done that as of yet you need to do it today because there'll be no time at that particular day when it takes place you can't see something coming it's going to be over with faster than the snap of a finger and we'll talk about that in just a little bit well, Pastor Stan, how do you know these things are going to take place? How do you know these things are taking place quickly? How do you know these things are rapidly moving in succession? Any person who is apologetic, uh, uh, professor of the Word of God, any person who has been studying the Word of God can see how very, uh, in a very uh, uh, type of uh, climatic uh, ascension and continuance of prophetic uh, prophecies have been fulfilled over the past number of decades it really doesn't take rocket science it just takes an open mind and seeing things that that we otherwise would not see you see this past week on Thursday was the Independence Day of Israel April the 19th 1948 and coming next month and of course there were celebrations all over Israel Coming this next month on May the 14th, 1948, it will be 70 years. Uh, when we began to think about that, 70 years. What is 70 years in a generation? What is 70 years when we began to think about what is involved in, in a, a generation or as God looks at it? But 70 years that uh, will be since Israel was given statehood. And so that is a day that there will certainly be uh, more uh, celebrations there'll be excitement and let's just say this the devil will also be spurring things on the other side against Israel trying to use other nations and terrorist groups and things to come against Israel because they are empowered of course by the devil himself and so we can look for those things that are actually taking place today prophecies being fulfilled now we see some of those things that are amping up as we began to look at these just like in that uh, anniversary that's upcoming 
But Israel, as we see, has a very important place, a stake in future events. Revelation speaks of Jerusalem. It speaks of Israel. It speaks of God doing a particular work and people coming back to the land as the people have been doing since 1948. And the land has just completely changed. You remember uh, the, uh, the writer Mark Twain from another generation. As he went over into Israel in his day and time and he looked at it, he went to the Valley of Jezreel, which will be the Valley of Armageddon, and he looked at it and he says, this is a desolate place. You could hardly see a person for 10 miles in any direction. Today, if you go back there, what you'll find in that valley is crops being pulled off, some of which to four times a year. Literally, the desolate place has begun to bloom again. The prophecies that were given 3,000 years ago of Ezekiel, Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, that this would, very thing would begin to take place, that cities would begin to grow, is actually taking place in Israel. They, you can put the side-by-side -side pictures of what it used to be just decades ago and what it is today, and there's all the difference in the world. It literally has blossomed forth. As you go down through the Jordan Valley, as we're riding down on our bus and, and making the, the tours over there, what we can see is that there are kibbutz, there are different agricultural farms and families, there are different places that have everything from, from palm tree nurseries to different types of hothouse uh, uh, where agriculture is being pulled off, uh, the most beautiful land in all the world where they're pulling off all types of crops, and it's taking place literally uh, year-round to some extent. And so when you begin to see that, the land has taken off. The other thing is that I think Israel themselves realize that God's hand is still upon them because as I began to talk about this a little bit and give the teaser for it last Sunday night, we were talking about the fact that uh, uh, this was going to be uh, you, the, the land that we have here and what it was going to be. What we, what we think about is that... Uh, the, the things that are happening in today's prophecy and the things that we see today are, are relative to everything that we know has got to take place before the end will come. Uh, what used to be a desolate place, very much a place. Israel recognizes their place in history because they're willing to take on the greatest foe in the world. It really doesn't matter who it is, if it's Syria, if it's Iran, it doesn't matter who may come against them, they're willing to stand and they're not waiting for even a, a group of countries to come together like the U.S., like France, uh, like Britain to come together and say, well, we're going to attack those who have, have done the chemical type of warfare in Syria. Uh, Israel goes ahead and attacks an Iranian place known for their terrorism that's located in that camp that's found in Syria. There's no waiting because Israel knows with God's hand upon them, they're going to strike. I think the wording that I use is like a chihuahua ready to take on a great dane. I mean, that's Israel. They know that God's on their side and that they're going to move forward. So as we think about that, it's not a, it's a, when you look at all of these prophecies, it's not a matter of is it going to take place. It's just a matter of when is it going to take place, and no one knows for sure. Jesus had so many things to say about his coming. He had told his disciples, remember a few weeks ago, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will doubtless come again, receive you unto myself, that where you are, there I may be uh, also. And so we know that that has been taking place. Jesus said it'll be quick as the lightning flashes in the east, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Two will be in the field working, and one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one will be left. He says, I'll come as a thief in the night. There'll be a stealthily type of, of fashion of what he does and how he does that so that uh, it'll be too fast of something taking place to do anything at that time. But he does say this, no one knows the hour or the day. So whenever these numerologists get together and they start saying, this has been this long, so Jesus is going to come back on this particular day, just write them off because Jesus said no one knows the hour of the day. 
in the time that you least expect it, he says, the Son of Man will come. Well, you say this, well, how do I know that he is coming back and that he's coming quickly? Three things we'd say about this, all involving the Trinity. And the first thing that we'd say about it is because of the faithful words of God. Verse 6, then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. These same words are repeated multiple times throughout the Revelation. These words are faithful and true. Why? Because they're accurate. It's not a scripture that is not being fulfilled, scripture that's not coming true. It's coming true. How do you know it's coming true? Because of its accuracy. Everything about Christ's first coming came true to the very point of, of where he would be born, how he would be born, of the lineage he would be born, uh, everything that could be said about him in his life, in his ministry, in his death, in his resurrection, uh, to even being sold for 30 pieces of silver over and over again, the things that would be said back a thousand years before in the psalmist that would be said as the words uh, echoed from his lips on the cross what was said a thousand years before in a prophecy. Its accuracy is, is unmatched in how the Word of God comes true. So when God says something, it's 100% correct. It has 100% accuracy in every way. It will come true. Now, we're not going to jump on a bandwagon of every story relating, well, that must have a prophetic um, reference there. You don't take everything that's happening everywhere in the world and put it together, but if it involves Israel, if it involves something that points scripturally, then certainly you cannot overlook that. Uh, so we see because of its accuracy, th these are faithful, true words of God, but also because of its authority. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. This is God's Word. doesn't contain God's Word. It is God's Word. You can't go and say, well, in this chapter you'll find God's Word, and over here on these pages you'll find God's Word. I would say to you, you tell me a page of Scripture where God's Word does not rest. It's on every page because it is the Word of God. Jesus said this, heaven and earth will pass away but my word will never pass away. But also I think we can say these are faithful words because of its accessibility. Notice what verse 10 says again, and that is don't seal up the words of this book. I didn't just write them to the seven churches of Asia Minor where they're being delivered here as John was instructed to write the words sent out to the seven churches that you'll find in chapters 2 and 3. But he's really saying, I want you to send it out to as many people who would ever read it. He knew that we would be reading this on April the 22nd, uh, 2018. He knew that this word would still be going forth. So the gospel is accessible for all people who will hear the gospel to hear the whosoevers of Scripture. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him. Over and over again, he's promised eternal life. And so it's accessibility. The faithful words of this last part of Scripture are given that we may take it very seriously and that we may each apply it to our lives in the way that it should be applied as far as salvation, as far as how we're being workers for our Lord, as far as facing him one day on the other side, as well as those that we know are not ready so when he's delivering this message he always says this to these churches he who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches the same thing is to us today we can hear these words and it can simply be a wah 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 Jesus is coming again or it could be that I'm going to take it very seriously because of the accuracy of God's Word it's always a hundred percent correct because of the authority of God's Word that it's God that's speaking and because of the accessibility of God's Word which says that it's for all people whosoever will God's call has always been to bring them in go out and get them whatever you have to do get the gospel message out but we also know he's coming quickly, not only because of the faithful words of God, but also because of the fruitful work of Christ. Jesus himself, as we said in this red letter edition that you may have, is doing the speaking. 
He is the one who says three different times, Behold, or surely, I am coming quickly. The same God who has always been, Jesus who's always been from eternity past, is the creator, as Colossians reminds us, as the first chapter of Genesis reminds us, he is the creator of this world, he is the sustainer of this world, and he will be the returner to this world to take us out. I tell you what, there's some days you're wanting to say, just like John does right here, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Take us out of this mess. We want to get out of here. But God says, until then, until I say that it's over, you be about the task I've put you at hand, the great commission that I've put before you, the daily commission to be crucified unto me and to live a life that brings glory to me and points others to Christ. That's what we're to be about. So he talks about the fruitful work of Christ. You see... When, when Christ came to this world, he came for the express purpose of dying for us that we may have access back to the Father. He had the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling us as sinful human beings back to the Holy Father. How could it be done? Through the Holy Son of God coming into this world to be physically born through a virgin birth and yet to be perfect in all of his ways and to die perfect for all of our death, our sins is, is in his death. They were placed upon him, and he could see them, and it was an awful cup of sorrow that he had to bear. What a sacrifice. So when we see the fruitful work of Christ and the work that he accomplished that was absolutely got the check mark by God uh, whenever he arose from the dead, just like he said he was going to do, it really ought to settle who we are. Settle who we are. Now, this time the revelation is speaking here. He's talking about that fact here. He's inviting people to come, and he's beginning to talk about mankind and who they are and how they're going to come. And so he begins to, to divide these out here in verses uh, 12 through 14. Blessed are those who do, do his commandments, that they have a right to eat the tree of life. But he also talks about those who are not ready. It ought to settle who we are. Knowing that Jesus is coming again, I remember as a small boy, every once in a while you would see on television a group of followers of Jesus that had gathered on a hillside thinking, today is the day Jesus is coming back. I remember as a child that kind of sending shockwaves through me thinking, am I ready? And knowing that I'd never really followed through. I'd never trusted Christ to my knowledge and, and followed through with believers' baptism and, at that particular time. And so it, it caused me to think. And even years after that, as you see other groups who said, well, this is going to be the day. Well, of course, it wasn't the day. But it does cause you to think, am I in or am I out? Am I going to be a part of those who are taken up or am I going to be a part of those that are left out? To know that he's coming quickly, to know that Christ made the way, it ought to settle what we are. But it ought to also settle who we are. As he continues through this passage here, he talks about that two different individuals or two different kinds of individuals. First of all, those who will be with him in verses 12 through 14. Many times we make a statement about somebody coming, maybe if somebody surprises you on a visit, they come to your house, and maybe you, you let them come in, you say, oh, if I would have known that you were coming, I'd have straightened up a little bit more. Now, if I'd have known you were coming, I'd have had some kind of dessert fixed. If I'd have known you were coming, my wash wouldn't be in the floor when I was getting ready to fold it, if I'd have known you were coming. Hey, we can't say that about the Lord Jesus because at any day we know he can come. And he's going to come one of these days. We don't know when. He's coming quickly, which means suddenly when he does come and receive us unto himself. So it ought to settle that in our eyes for, for those who will be with him first off. Let's remember what he says in 1 Corinthians 15 uh, when he begins to talk about that in verse 52. He says, I'm going to come in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and we will be changed. What is the twinkling of an eye? Well, let's talk a little bit about the blinking of an eye. Now, the blinking of an eye, depending on how fast your eye moves, <laughs> the blinking of an eye 
uh, as we think about, let's talk about this first, the winking of an eye. Maybe it's a short wink, maybe it's a quick, it's a, it's a longer wink. It could take between a half a second to a, a whole second for you to, to wink. Now everybody's winking, don't wink at me, okay? You're, you're winking right now. All right, but then think about the blinking of an eye. I mean, you're just involuntarily sitting there and all of a sudden it's just, it's, your eye just bats, you know, and, and this, most of you are doing right now. And your eye's batting. Well, they tell us that that takes somewhere uh, between a third, closer to a third than a half of a second for the, an eye to quickly blink. That's the blinking of an eye. The twinkling of an eye, the time of light entering into the front part of the eye, bouncing off the back, they tell us in numbers that none of us can understand except to say that it could be closer to a billionth of a second. The twinkling of an eye. That's not blinking. That's not winking. That's twinkling. It means it's going to be so quick no one can do it. Now, we couldn't do anything if it was a blink or a wink. But this is the twinkling of an eye. That's how quick. No time. Oh, there's Jesus. I want to repent of my sins. No, no. Gone. By the time we realize it, it's already going to be too late. When we think about that, we ought to think about our own lives because what's the first thing we're going to face when he calls us up into the clouds is the judgment seat. Now, you hear me talk about that some because I think it's going to be uh, a terrifying day uh, in, in many ways. For believers, you say, no, once we get out of here and go to heaven, it's going to be a wonderful day. This is not a time that we go to heaven and the, the gates of heavenly Disney World are opened and we just run in. We have to go as believers before the judgment seat of Christ. And if it's something that Paul had some fear about, then I would say that I and you need to have some fear about it as well. You say, well, I thought you weren't supposed to be fearful. I think we ought to count the cost and think about what has our life been like? What have we done for Christ since the time we became believers, whoever we are? Because that's what's going to appear. And he says we're going to be judged according to that which we've done. 2 Corinthians 5, 8, and the verses that follow after that talk about up through verse 10, as well as 1 Corinthians chapter 3. That those works, whether good or bad, they're going to be taken, burnt as of by fire to see what's going to stand and what then can be rewarded and given to us as rewards that we can place at the feet of Jesus. Anybody in their right mind wants to have something to present to the Savior of the world, some type of crown, some type of reward for the one who gave his life for me. David Jeremiah, in preaching on this, I heard him the other week say it again. Two times in the Revelation, because sometimes people say this comment, and they say, well, there, there are no tears in heaven, no tears in heaven. That's that song. It says no tears in heaven. Well, the Bible does say there are two times there are tears. And one of those is at the time right after the judgment seat of Christ. Why would believers have tears? I would say except, and that's what he was hitting on, except for the fact that we have not done what we should have done in this Christian life. We just kind of took his salvation and said, great, I'm good to go on my own until I get to heaven one day. Nothing, I don't have to do anything. No, you can't merit your salvation. But listen, he does expect us to be followers and ambassadors. He expects us to work while it's day for the night is coming. He expects us to glorify him. He expects us to win the lost. He expects us to be mission-minded. He expects us to be a part of his greater program. Yes, he is going to, to, to judge us according to how we worked with people. If we, we maybe taught in the Sunday school, we served as a deacon, how we volunteered on this particular program, did things that other people didn't necessarily even want to do when involved the work of the church and ministering to others. He's judging all of that. And we will give an account on that day. The judgment seat will be a time of regret for many believers who have not lived to that point of what we should have done in our life. And I'm afraid all of us will have some regrets but some may have more. You see, when we begin to think about that and we think about him coming quickly one day, and even when the trials and pressures and stresses of this life get to all of us and we say, you're just not sure we can take any more right now, that old song says it good when it says, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face 
all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Do you think those early apostles that ran and they were, they were persecuted, they were even thrown to the lions, they were rolled in tar and pitch and set afire, those that were, were killed for their faith, do you think they didn't have some tough days, but they stuck by it, and they were rewarded accordingly when they got to the other side? God has a special crown for those martyrs who gave their life. But he says, when you get to heaven, then blessed are those who do his commandments, because now they have a right to eat of that great tree of life that, of course, has been banned since they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And so we know that, that, that there will be those that are with him. We who know Christ will be with him. Then he says there are those who will not be there. Verse 15 says one of the saddest pictures in all the Bible. Those who have never believed, those who have never trusted in the shed blood of, of Christ, of what he did for them on the cross as he talks about that fact. But outside, outside the gates of that city, he says there are dogs, another name for Gentiles, another name for those who were looked to be the outcast that, that did not, would not receive Christ. Who were these? Let me say this. This is not just the mean people of the world. These are not just the terrorists of the world. These are not just the Hollywood type of this world. This is not just those who were the rich and had money flowing everywhere and, and had the best of life to eat like the rich man in Luke chapter 16. These were good church-going people who had heard the gospel enough times to respond, but they kept putting it off thinking there's going to be a better time. There's going to be a better opportunity somewhere, and one day I'll do this, but they kept putting it off. And so they'll all be labeled together and spend an eternity away from our Savior. Yes, it should settle who we are, knowing that Christ is coming back. And friend, if you find yourself in that latter group then why would you want to stay there? Why wouldn't you come today and say, you know, I want to make sure that I'm on the Lord's side, that I'm a part of his redeemed in that family. It, settle who, it settle who, uh, settles whose we are as well. Verse 16, I've sent my angel to testify these things to the church, to remind us of the fact that we are his. Malachi says in 3.17 that they shall be mine, says the Lord, in that day when I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. And so he reminds us that we ought to be lovers of the church, following in his footsteps. The word here was to the seven churches, but to all churches that it would be delivered to, including us today as we're reading this. And he says, I who am the, the root of the offspring of David. It's interesting that he says the root here of the offspring of David because not only did David come from that root, as we think about his source, his heir, where he came from, but we think about that Jesus certainly will sit upon the throne of David. Jesus is the source and the son of David when you look at it in that way. But he's also the light of creation. Not only created the first light, but he's coming again. And he is that morning star. Uh, as we think of the light of the world, uh, there's no need, remember, in heaven for the sun or the moon because he is the light. But one last thing I'll say about this passage of Scripture is that we ought to know he's coming quickly and believe that because of the witness, the final witness of the Spirit. Verses 17 through 21 tell us about this final witness. Verse 17 reminds us that of the last welcome. He says it one more time here. To the Spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who hears say, come. Let him who thirsts say, come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. You kind of get the idea that God wants more in heaven than are going. You kind of get the idea that this is open to all whosoever will may come. The final invitation of Scripture is, more can come. You can come. You need to invite others to come that will be a part of this great day. 
Perhaps that's why back in chapter 3, as, as Jesus was speaking to the church there, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I'm not going to kick it down, but I'm knocking on the door of the heart. If they'll hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and fellowship with them and them with me, but we have to make that decision. We're free moral agents, but God gives us an opportunity to say yes or an opportunity to say no. And for many, sometimes it is, well, not now. But I want to remind you that would say that. He's coming quickly. And when he does, it's too late to make a decision. He gives also a last warning in verses 18 and 19. To he who adds to the words of this book, he says in verse 18, if you add to what Scripture actually says, you've created other Scriptures and said maybe they're lost books of the Bible, you said that this is also ought to be treated as Scripture just like what's in the 66 books of the Bible, or you've kind of added it in your way or changed it in your way. He says, I'm going to give to you, I'm going to add all the plagues that are written in this book. Now let me just remind you of the 10 plagues of the Exodus. I don't think I'd want even the 10 plagues of the Exodus, not to speak of the other plagues that were upon those who opposed God. And so he says, this is what can be coming your way, the person who adds to this book, but also, verse 19, a person that, that takes away from this book. He says, I'm going to take away your part from the book of life, from the holy city, from the things written in this book. The strictest of punishments, the person that takes away. Now remember, this, this is also given in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, and Proverbs chapter 30, verse 6. And there are liberals who would try to explain away Scripture. Well, you know, God wasn't really saying this. What he was really saying was, was something totally different. Uh, and they began to try to explain things away. They would find themselves in this number who would add to or take away from Scripture. You see, here we find that Peter said for those who would say, well, the Lord didn't say he's really going to come back in this particular fashion and some make fun, saying, well, I don't think he's coming at all because 2,000 years have come and gone. Remember that Peter reminded us that there were scoffers that are saying, where's the promise of his coming since the fathers fell asleep? All these things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. In other words, he hasn't come to this point. Why should we believe that he is coming now? Because of the accuracy of God's word, because of the promise that is sure, because God's 100% always truthful in what he said, because of Christ, because of the resurrection, and because of the promise given. The only thing that should really affect us today is the fact that we're closer than we've ever been. His coming could be today. And one of those days, somebody may be saying that, and all of a sudden, bam, we're out of here. What a day that will be. Well, we know in the midst of this last warning, there's also a last word, verses 20 and 21. Notice that the Lord just kind of seals this up, and he says, I'm going to seal this, what I've said, with these final words. And, and so he says again, surely I'm coming quickly. Whenever Christ, whenever you find in Scripture that there's a, an emphasis, whether the words are back-to-back, -back, whether it's holy, 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 and you have a threefold uh, descriptive uh, uh, term representing who God is, or if it's something that is said in repetitive notion, every time that it has said in that way, it means that there, this is to be noticed. This is to be looked at. It is being repeated. It is being repeated. The same thing if you're in a class somewhere and your teacher is saying, now you will see this again on the final exam. And somewhere else in class, he says, now you'll see this on the final exam. And then he says again, you're going to see this on the final exam. You know what? There's a good point to hear that you're going to see it on the final exam. So if Jesus says, I'm coming quickly, guess what? He's coming quickly. When he says it three times in the same phrase here, the same portion of this chapter, it means I'm going to come quickly suddenly when I come. You can't do anything in the twinkling of an eye. You can't change a thing. We're gone. We're out of here. And yes, some will be taken and some will be left behind. Jesus is coming quickly and eternity will be sealed. The message of grace is a free gift of salvation of all who would receive today. 
But friend, don't put it off. If you're here today and you don't know Christ, then by all means, come today. Say, I want to, I want to nail this down. This is too big a thing. He's going to come quickly. I don't have time to do it later. I need to take care of this today. Well, what's so-and-so going to think if I have to get up out of the pew and come? They'll think a lot more of you. And maybe they'll even start thinking about their own life. Well, maybe I'm not ready. If they're not ready, perhaps many people could think many things. But the most important thing is that we can stand for Jesus and we can know him as our personal Lord and Savior. We find that... Sometimes life is given long, and sometimes there's shortness of life. Such was the case for Robert Murray McShane, a great man of God who experienced more in his short 30 years than most people do in a lifetime. He had a watch, and on the back of his watch was inscribed just these little words, The night cometh. Always reminding him that in this ministry and the life we live as believers, that the night is coming when we'll work no more. We're working today. We're, we're putting forth the invitation to all who will hear locally, around our region, around our state, around our nation, around our world, and they have to respond to this. But one day the work will be over and he will call us unto himself. And friend, if you happen to be left behind because you really didn't know Christ, let me just say that all hell will pour forth on this earth. Act like you've never seen it before. And, the, and what we read in the Revelation is it's going to be some really tough times that we have not known. They'll even be crying for the rocks to fall on them. That's how bad it's going to get. I don't want anybody that I know to be left behind. I wouldn't want any of my family members to be left behind. My friends, any person that I know, I should care that much for them. How about in your life today? Maybe as a believer, do you say, well, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I'm good. Hey, how about them? How about others for also for whom Jesus died? Was his blood shed in vain as he died for them as well? What can we do about that? Today, perhaps, as you're thinking about these words, I'm coming quickly. Several things ought to enter into our mind. First of all, are we a part of the redeemed? When he comes quickly, suddenly, will we go? And if not, you need to make that decision today. We'll be glad to pray with you and help you. The second thing is this as believers. Can we become so lulled into sleep in this, in this evil world in which we live and the things that are going on all around us and you know everything that we see on the news that, and our busy schedules that we just begin to lose touch with the fact that other people aren't going? And that all of us know people that are family members that we really ought to be weeping for. That we ought to be telling. That we ought to be making sure before they get to a point when they cannot respond. As they want to. As they would like to perhaps again. They can get to that point. Can we have a heart for them? Maybe you think about those that you go to school with, those that you work with, those that are your neighbors, those that you say really are your friends. We ought to have a heart for them, a burden on our heart for them that they can know Christ and they can be willing and ready to go, submitted to him when he comes again. Hey, the prophecies are lining up and we see them fulfilled on every side. Surely, just as surely as those things are taking place, he is coming quickly. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, in this time, I realize that across this congregation of this size, there may be many people who are really thinking about where they stand between themselves and you. Some that have never trusted Christ as Savior. Some that say, I thought I was saved, but I don't really think that I am. And I'm just not sure that, Lord, they need to make sure. Would you give them the strength even today? to be willing to look to you and to confess that they're lost, that they're a sinner, and that they need a Savior, and they believe it's Jesus, and ask him to come into their heart. Father, would you lead them then to, to come and to tell us what they've done? Or maybe we can pray with them about that. Oh, Father, there's no better day because you're coming suddenly. We may never preach another message on this before you come. 
So, Lord, help us to respond today. It's the last words of Scripture. You're coming quickly. Father, I pray this will be the day. Then I pray for every child of God today. Oh, God, grip our hearts. Grip our hearts. Make us weep again. Make us pray again. Make us share again. Lord, help us to do your work because the night's coming and we'll work no more. Grip our hearts because you're coming quickly. And the prophecies are lining up and the signs of the times are here. And we don't know when, but it's sooner than later. Oh, Father, grip our hearts today. Perhaps somebody's on our heart for a burden. Lord, help us just to bring that burden to the altar today. Whatever decisions in this place need to be made, other decisions to follow in believers, baptism, membership, whatever it may be, God, just give us the strength to make those decisions today in Jesus' name. Amen. So we stand our invitational, for our invitational hymn, Would You Stand? Whatever the decision is, come to Christ today. Come tell us what you've done. Maybe it's to come pray for somebody else that you're not sure of or that you know is lost and you've got them on your heart and you're just going to say, oh, God, I want this person to know you. Whatever the need is, would you come right now? Jesus is coming quickly. We see that three times there in that particular passage that we read today. He's coming. There's no doubt about it. We don't know the day, the hour. Scripture says that no man can know. Jesus said that himself. And so whenever someone says, I know it's going to be this day, this month, uh, whatever we know, we can write that off because Jesus said no one can know it. But at the same time, it does not negate the fact that he is coming. And when he comes, he's going to come quickly. No time in that twinkling of an eye for there to be a repentance, a confession, for someone to make something right in their life. For you, if you've never trusted Christ and his provision for you on the cross, if you never ask him to be your Savior who died for your sins as you repent of those sins, then it's going to be too late in that day. So why not today? Since Jesus is coming and he's going to come quickly, why not today make it the day where we each bow our heads and ask Christ to be our Lord, our Savior, to forgive us, and so that we will be ready during that particular time when he comes, and that we'll be watching, we'll be understanding that, we'll be living in the light of his soon coming. Would you bow your heads with me right now? We're all going to pray and put ourselves in a position where the Lord will be ready to take us. Father, thank you so much for this particular day, this passage of scripture that has uh, has taken our hearts and and reminded us of the truth that the world just tries to push off as if the world will go on forever but we know that according to your word which has been 100 percent reliable and accurate in all things to this point is going to be accurate in that as well and so lord we know that you're going to come and you're going to come quickly and in the moment when we think not the Bible says we're, that you're going to come. And so, Lord, we want to be ready. And so I'm first of all praying right now for those that are watching the broadcast who do not know their heart is right with you. They don't know there's ever been a time in their life where they have repented of their sins and asked Christ to come in. And right now I pray that you'll give them the grace to ask, Lord, uh, you to come into their life. Father, right now I pray that you'd help them to pray a prayer of faith much like this. Dear God, I realize that I am a sinner. I've sinned against you. But I also realize that Jesus paid for my sins when he died on the cross. Please forgive me of my sin and come into my life. May Jesus be my personal Savior from this day forth. Give me the power to live for you. And Father, I thank you for each one who prayed that prayer, who, who want to be in a right standing before you and now ready to follow you and to leave other things behind and the most important thing, to be ready ourselves and to help others to be ready for that occasion. Lord, I pray today for other believers that have grown into a, 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 an area of just going along with the flow and, and just uh, letting life pass them by. And there's no urgency, there's no passion in the way they live as if we're going to live on forever and as if we're just going to go into heaven and that nothing's going to be required of us. Lord, I pray this day that we would be reminded of that awesome judgment seat of Christ where that revealing will take place of how we've lived this Christian life faithfully or, or unfaithfully, if we lived it for you or lived it for ourselves. 
And so I pray right now, Lord, that we would just come back to you in such a way that we'd be living in the certain hope and reality that this could be the day of your coming. Lord, forgive us where we failed you to this point, but I pray we'd have a new desire, a new passion, a new vigor to go forth and to proclaim the gospel, to talk to other people, to be ready ourselves to do your work while it is day because you said that the night is coming when man will work no more. Father, work upon every heart this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for watching the broadcast today. You know, our week should be that we go forth to give God glory, to share the good news with other people in the constant hope and realization that Jesus could come any day. What a glorious day that's going to be, but we want to be ready. I hope that we'll all live that way. I hope we'll live ready before him in that realization of his coming. May you have a good and a godly week, and we'll see you next time. If you would like to support this or any other ministry at West Asheville Baptist Church, you can visit our website, westashevillebaptist.org, to give online or by calling our office at 828-253-9824.